Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Chloe Chalinor, the chair of the Royal Aeronautical Society Air Law Group. On behalf of the Society, on behalf of the Group Committee, I welcome you to our lecture and summer reception. As many of you are aware, our summer reception is usually an our annual event and a highlight of the year, but due to COVID, tonight's reception is the first of three years. So we are really pleased that so many of you have joined us tonight, especially on such a balmy evening. I'm obliged to provide you with some important housekeeping arrangements. Please bear with me. There will not be a fire alarm test in the building today, therefore if the alarm sounds, please exit the building. The RAS ES designated assembly point is the paved and railed area at the junction of Hamilton Place and Piccadilly beyond the Intercontinental Hotel. RAES staff will be on hand to guide you, if not follow George. <laughs> if you have mobility or access issues, please make yourself known to a member of the event staff so they can make necessary arrangements for your safe exit from the building in the case of an emergency. Please do not leave unmarked bags or other items unattended. Please switch your mobile phones to silent during the lecture. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube post-event. Please feel free to share this with your colleagues and contacts. After the presentation, there will be a 10 to 15 minute opportunity to ask Kate questions. Lastly, and most importantly, the lecture will close at 7 p.m. Our drinks reception on the terrace will follow. Please head upstairs after the lecture. We are extremely grateful to Kennedy's for the very generous sponsorship of the event, and particularly to Mark Wellborn for organising this. So thank you, Mark. So before our drinks, we are extremely fortunate to be joined by Kate Staples tonight, who will be delivering our lecture. I think that most of us in the room are familiar with Kate's stellar career, but for those who are not, I'm happy to provide her biography. Most of Kate's legal ca career was in the aviation sector. She stepped down from her role as a general counsel and secretary to the UK Civil Aviation Authority in December 2021, having held the role for over 11 years. Whilst at the CAA, Kate was also a trustee of the Air Travel Trust, the UK's statutory compensation scheme for holidaymakers, and advised the CAA's two subsidiaries, ASSI Limited and CAA International Limited. Before joining the CAA, Kate was head of the Aviation and Commercial Legal Team at the UK Department for Transport, and for one year only, she was head of Railways Track and Safety Legal Team. Kate did not start off as an aviation lawyer. In her early career, she specialised in high-value construction and engineering disputes at a leading city practice. In addition to her professional qualifications, Kate has an MBA and recently completed a Master's in Innovation, Creativity and Leadership at City University's Bayes Business School. Kate enjoys the arts, travel, developing her photography skills and following the fortunes of Liverpool FC. <laughs> I have no doubt that Kate will provide us with a fascinating insight into her career. So Kate, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chloe, for that introduction. First things first, uh, I'm renowned for being very quiet. So can you hear me at the back? Excellent. Well, you might, you might not be saying that in a few minutes' time. Um, I'm really rather surprised to see so many people here today, and it's, it's a real uh, pleasant surprise to see some very familiar, I'm not going to call them old faces, but those I have known for some time, and also lots of new faces uh, who I hope to catch up with at drinks later on. And um, as Chloe said, I stepped down from the CAA at the end of last year. And from my perspective, my aviation legal career is very much in the rear view mirror. Um, but in preparing for today, and I, I tried not to think of it as a lecture actually, because I thought speaking to a, a room full of experts on air law um, w was probably going to be quite challenging because your, your particular expertise is so different and disparate and I'm, I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't be able to tell you anything you didn't know. So what I've tried to do is, is look back at some of the experiences I've had and um, use those experiences and perhaps some of the frustrations they've generated to look forward and offer a few thoughts, you know, criticisms perhaps, uh, as to what the future could hold. And I'm going to, going to do that over the next 35 minutes or so. Um, and as I said, the good news is that I have no intention of delivering a blow-by-blow -blow account of aviation law that I have known and loved. Um, and quite frankly, that's beyond my capabilities. Both of those at the same time. 
Um, but I'm going to try and break my, my lecture down into three sections. First of all, I'll look on, back on my time at the Department for Transport, that's DFT. Then I'll move forward to my years at the CAA. And lastly, I'll share a few thoughts that look to the future. And in doing all of that, I'll try and discern a few themes that occur to me and uh, some recurring issues that crop up. And I should, conscious of the fact that this is being recorded, be very, very clear that these are my intensely personal reflections. Um, and they certainly do not respect, represent the truth or you know, how it actually might be for others in the room. And I would also uh, like to emphasize that none of my former colleagues at CAA or DFT have been harmed in the making of these notes. <laughs> and I hope that remains the case uh, at the end of uh, the next 30 minutes or so. So, I think it was Paul Theroux who once wrote that travel is glamorous only in retrospect. At the moment though, if you look at air travel in particular, it's anything but glamorous at any time, in prospect or retrospect. And it's, I thought it would be naive of me not to at least acknowledge the travails that the sector is going through at the moment. Indeed, when I was organizing my thoughts for today, I learned that US media organizations were busy offering guidance to their readers about anticipated tra travel disruption in Europe. And I also learned that rates of flight cancellation in the US in June were three times their pre-COVID levels. And I think that's, again, been in the media today. And I'm sure, like me, you've all seen pictures of passengers queuing through to airport buildings out onto the forecourts. You've seen lines of disgruntled people, particularly at the UK border, and you've seen piles of luggage awaiting collection. And you've probably also read or heard uh, angry passengers sharing their experiences. I would say that it only may seem to be bad because the way things presented in the media is not necessarily entirely accurate. And again, when I was doing some research before today's session, I looked at some statistics. And it's probably the case that the percentage of flights cancelled is, for certain airlines at least, really rather low. But it just has uh, assumed a significant um, popular presence because the media likes, likes, likes the story. And that's because, for good or ill, aviation remains a very newsworthy subject. But if yours is the flight or holiday that's cancelled or disrupted, you don't care about statistics. But if we look at where we are now, that's 2022, we can see that relative to the preceding two years, there's been a huge and recent surge in air travel or the demand for air travel. If you like, it's revenge travel, making up for the opportunities that we were deprived of uh, in 2020 and 2021. But it's revenge travel at a time when there are staff shortages because of the impacts of COVID. And it says here in my notes, because I'm very conscious I'm being recorded, the changed relationship between the, the UK and the EU, which is co code for Brexit and all, all things Brexit. And that's had an impact on schedules, on service availability, on the availability of people. And if prices are higher than they were because of the cost of fuel, we feel as though we're paying more for less. Indeed, um, one contact of mine who's a frequent traveler despite uh, COVID is beyond frustrated. And he described um, his response to the recent travails in the aviation sector as having been brought about by two things. On the one hand, he said, over promising and under delivery and on the, on the other, the lack of a single guiding mind. No one ex escaped his trenchant criticisms. Airports, airlines, service providers, governments, regulators. At the time, though, I did wonder whether consumers themselves escaped too lightly from his criticisms. And I'll come back to that uh, later on uh, in, in this session. Despite all that, um, I'm high as a kite at the moment because I have just come back from my first proper holiday in four years. Um, I describe a proper holiday as one that takes more than a week and it means that I go to more than one different place during that week. 
So I have just come back from a fortnight in British Columbia. I should have gone in 2019, and f at the fourth time of asking, we managed to get away uh, at the end of June. It was delightful. And I cannot tell you how wonderful it is to get away and see things and do things that I've not done before. Now, as an optimist by nature, I try not to dwell on negative things. And, and when it comes to air travel, I always try and keep in mind that unique moment when I arrive somewhere that I've not been before. Somewhere that looks different. Sometimes it smells different. Sometimes it tastes different. But it's always utterly magical. And uh, without revealing too much about my tastes in uh, films, I'm always reminded of the, of the Love Actually scenes. Uh, you may remember the ones I'm thinking of. The one where Hugh Grant, as Prime Minister, um, re returns to Heathrow and is greeted enthusiastically by Martine McCutcheon. And then the clothing, closing scenes where we see re real people meet and greet the ones they love in the arri arrival hall at Heathrow. Um, that last scene with real people meeting real people um, always brings a tear to my eye. And I mean, cheesy as those scenes might be, they might explain our continuing fascination with aviation. And that fascination isn't new. Um, and it bears repeating, and I, I do need to read this uh, because this is a quote. It bears repeating that international civil aviation can greatly help to create and preserve friendship and understanding among the nations and peoples of the world. And it's also desirable to avoid friction and to promote cooperation between nation and peoples because the peace of the world depends on it. Those aren't my lofty words. Those words are taken from the Chicago Convention in the preamble. Now, I'm, I knew nothing about that convention when I started law. I accidentally fell into aviation law. Uh, indeed, I only became an aviation lawyer because the trains were in a bad way at the time. Um, on my first day at DFT, uh, I had a meeting with my legal director, and he offered me a role in one of two teams, the rail team, the aviation team. Curiosity peaked. I said, hmm, tell me more about this rail job then. He said, oh, Kate, it's all about the administration of rail track. I said, no, let me stop you there. I had absolutely no desire to get involved in the insolvency of a transport company that could affect thousands of travellers and perhaps leave some of them stranded. That was certainly not for me. So I said, I'll take aviation, please. And as Chloe said, having previously specialised in high-value construction and engineering claims, I knew very little, if anything, about aeroplanes and the aviation industry. But despite that almost complete and utter ignorance, on day one, I was given a huge pile of files, you can tell how old I am because it was paper, and I was tasked with drafting an aviation security direction. This was a d direction to the aviation industry that would specify requirements that had to be fulfilled to, to secure safe and secure flying. And I recall that it was something to do with cockpit doors and making sure that cockpit doors were closed during flight. Looking back on the rest of my time at DFT, I'm pleased to say that my ignorance dissipated slightly over the, the successive six to seven years. And there were a number of areas where I sort of kept coming back to in giving advice to ministers and, and officials. And aviation security was one of them. And at the time, this was a, a growth industry. And that's because I joined DFT shortly after the 9-11 attacks in the US and shortly after the EU gave gained legal competence in relation to aviation, aviation security, and the one was directly related to the other. So over the course of four to five years, I advised on a range of rather peculiar things, all to do with aviation security. For example, armed police officers on aircraft, and more particularly the practicalities of armed police, police officers. Where would they sit? How would their seats be paid for? How would they get their weapons on board? Those sorts of nitty-gritty issues that come with a high-level policy, such as having armed police officers. And having armed police officers was essentially part of a, an expanded range of ever more intrusive and extensive aviation security requirements that were being introduced. 
and as a consequence of some of those requirements, we entered into relatively feisty litigation about whether compensation was payable to airlines as a consequence of the increased costs. And that took some two years to resolve, albeit it was re resolved in, in a way that was beneficial to the DFT. Um, litigation wasn't a great feature of my career at DFT, but I do recall lots and lots of um, trips that my team made to the e EU and, and to the ECJ to litigate tennis, tennis rackets in aircraft cabins. Can anybody remember tennis rackets in aircraft cabins, or is it just me? It's just me. Okay, I'll move on. Um, perhaps more interestingly, from the legal side of things, there were two knotty legal questions that were um, you know, quite striking at the time and, and have stuck in the memory since. The first of those um, was to work um, to bring about some retrospective legislation. It's not very common. If you do want to legislate respectively, you have to get the permission of the Attorney General. And in this case, we needed to get the permission of the Attorney General because the Secretary of State didn't want to become involved in a dispute about funding police at a particular airport. The legislation dated back to the early 1970s and nobody really remembered it, remembered it until a dispute arose about funding. And rather than make a decision on funding, we removed that requirement retrospectively, which was fun. Uh, the other peculiarity that really springs to mind is um, making an air navigation order by emergency in August when the Queen was on holiday at Balmoral. Um, it, it was necessary because the US had introduced requirements relating to passenger information and the requirement that pass passenger information be provided before any person landing in the US uh, got through the border, as it were. We had, I think, about two weeks to organize all this, including getting uh, the Queen to make the necessary order in council. But by far the most difficult thing about that was persuading my DFT colleagues that this wasn't an abuse of power and that the pr provisions in the ANO and the, and the provisions in the, the 1982 Act were broad enough to encompass them. Um, fortunately, it wasn't all as exciting as um, uh, aviation security. Uh, we did dabble a little bit in European things. Um, for example, and, and try not to sort of smile when you h hear me mention this, we had to deal with the consequences of the creation of EASA. Um, it, it was a new body in 2003, and it would have an impact on how the institutions in the UK were organized, who did what, and uh, in what circumstances. So we need to, needed to spend some time organizing that. And we also needed to spend some time making sure that the enhancements of the single European aviation market were properly reflected in the UK. Um, as an aside, I do have a commemorative mug from the UK's presidency of the EU in 2005. It's in almost pristine condition. It serves as a pen holder in the kitchen. If anyone is interested in acquiring it from me, I will take bids later on. Um, economic regulation. It's often one of those sort of more dusty and uh, obscure areas, but it actually proved to be quite a significant area, both sort of uh, during my time at DFT, but also sub subsequently at CAA. And one of the key things that happened in the early part of, or well, the first half of the first decade of this century, BAA was broken up. And one of the sort of related decisions or decisions that was taken round about that time was the removal of Stansted from economic regulation under the Airports Act of 1986. Now you'd think that'd be a fairly dry and dusty topic. It actually generated some very significant disagreement between DFT and CAA officials. Um, really, you know, it, it sort of took me by surprise and I think the extent of the, degreement, the disagreements were such that it actually in my view at least, contributed to the pilling review that then took place of the CAA, which in turn led to some more far-reaching changes that I'll come on to. And a f another area that's been a feature um, of work at DFT for, for decades now is noise, aviation noise, and in particular how to re regulate and control 
aircraft noise at the big three London airports, but also at airports throughout the UK. And litigation about air aircraft noise in London had been going on pretty much every year since the early 1990s at DFT. And that remained the case throughout the development of the Air Transport White Paper and afterwards leading up to the decision that Heathrow should expand, which Jeff Hoon took, I think, in January 2009. And all of that you know, was, a, was a feature of my day-to-day -day activity. But at this distance, and, and noting that my memory is becoming increasingly fallible, I'm struck by how little um, work I did on consumer protection. And I don't really remember DFT um, being very active in that space. Nor was general aviation a, a big feature, nor was innovation or technological advances. But rega regardless of the subject area, what I am struck by looking backwards and was struck by on a number of occasions at the time was just how difficult it was to build a coherent and end-to-end -end process for making, implementing and reviewing policy and law. And if I were being really critical, I'd say, and I can re recall one particular example very easily, in a few cases, actually making the law that would implement policy was a complete afterthought, absolutely completely forgotten about until we, you know, colleagues recognized that something had to be done. By contrast, in other cases, making law was a habit that pe people had got into. We'd got into making law because we could. More positively, um, I'd say that we were pragmatical pragmatic and practical. Uh, we focused on what needed to be done now and move on to the next task or project. We didn't really con question the framework because it was familiar and we had a common purpose both within the DFT and CAA, but also with colleagues we were working with at a European level. And that was particularly evident to me in relation to aviation security because in the early days of the EU having competence, um, I was surprised that Commission officials agreed, albeit informally, that in the UK we could continue to use our domestic powers to legislate for aviation security requirements, even though we didn't need to because it was being made by way of regulation. The Commission officials were sufficiently interested in getting things onto the statute book and making it work that they you know, bent the rules for us for a period of time at least. There were a few areas where we weren't pragmatic and practical and we did take a little bit more time to think about things. And the most obvious one that I recall was the environment and aviation's impacts on it and how to put something into the statutory framework that mentioned the environment. Um, over a period of months in the context of our work on the Civil Aviation Act 2006, we wrestled with the problem and we tried out various different forms of wording but if you look at the 1982 Act you'll still see no reference in section 4 which is the CAA's objectives to the environment. That's because we simply couldn't work out what we wanted to say still less how we wanted to say it. Um, that problem did come back again actually in relation to the 2012 Act and that's the one that deals with the licensing of uh, the big airports that have significant market power. Um, Things like aviation are wicked messes, to use business jargon, and I do apologize for that. You know, there are areas where there are difficult trade-offs to be made. Consensus is almost impossible to get. And whilst legislation can create a framework or identify factors, so you can look at the Transport Act, Section 70, it will never be able to set out the equation or the algorithm that will deliver you the single right answer. You'll always need judgment and somebody will have to reach that judgment, and it's unlikely they will uh, please everyone. Moving forward now from the DFT, uh, it used to be the case that you, you, you moved around the civil service every three to four years. Just as you started to know an area, you were moved on um, to prevent you becoming dangerous in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I managed to stay below the radar for longer than that in aviation, but as Chloe mentioned earlier, I did get put to railways for one year, but one year was enough, and I went back to aviation when I joined the CAA in September 2010. And I found an organization then was, that was absolutely steeped in deep knowledge and technical expertise and experience. 
And it was absolutely terrifying coming from a, a policy heavy uh, department into a technical regulatory organization. And I recall in the first few weeks of being in post, I met most of my team one to one and I would ask them, or I started asking them, so how long have you worked for the CAA? I stopped asking that question after I'd met about four of them and by that time the total experience exceeded 100 years. I thought to myself, I don't really want to know how much hinterland and baggage I've, I've got to deal with. But at, at that time, the CAA had a, a new chair, or a relatively new chair, that's Dame Deirdre Hutton, and its first CEO in Andrew Haynes. And together they had been enjoined by government to focus on consumers in a way that um, hadn't been the case previously. And to look again at the CAA's strategic approach to make sure that it was clear what it was doing, but also why it was doing it. Um, I've heard it said, and I won't mention by whom to protect their, in, their identity, that the CAA used to think of consumers or passengers as self-loading baggage. Um, now, as I say, I don't know whether that's true. I, I, I can recall it being said to me on a number of occasions, but I think it's fair to say that if that was the case prior to 2009, when Deirdre Hutton and Andrew Haynes joined, it's certainly not been the case since then. And since that time, consumer experience has been front and centre of the CAA's work. And you can see that in the 2012 Act and the focus on consumers in the, econ the economic regulation of Heathrow and Gatwick. You can see it in the extensive work that's been done on passengers with reduced mobility and the much talked about Regulation 261. And you can also see it in the reforms of the Atoll regime and the CAA response to Monarch and Thomas Cook failing. And in addition to that sort of steadfast consumer focus, uh, yes, there have been some common themes again, and yes, it's been aviation security. With aviation security, um, having assumed regulatory responsibilities in about 2014-15, the CAA has been um, getting to grips with cyber resili resilience and cyber security, which is the growth area. And that's particularly interesting because that's an area where technology moves quickly, threats ever-changing. As a regulatory body that's in the public sector, it can be difficult to recruit and retain people because the pay is not the same as it would be in the private sector. And where your traditional inspection and audit regimes really don't work. So that's been an area where a different approach has been adopted using expertise from third parties with the CAA focusing on the extent to which organisations are responding properly to the expertise they are procuring. Um, of course, Europe deserves a mention, and you may have noticed that the uh, UK has left the EU, so one of the key areas of work for the CAA for the last three years certainly has been addressing the consequences of leaving the EASA system and making sure that post um, initially the exit date but also post the end of this year there was continuity of service and that longer term we know what the model will be but I should add I haven't been at the CAA for seven months now so I don't know what that model for the future will be so please don't ask me about it and we've also continued at the CAA to look at economic regulation using the new powers in the 2012 Act and noise and noise was uh, came from nowhere, really, as an issue. Uh, in, in the first year of my time at the CAA, a decision letter would be about a page, a page and a half. Roll forward six or seven years, decisions on uh, noise-related issues, and in particular airspace changes, were running, in some cases, to, to hundreds of pages because of the complexity and because of the degree to which people were um, seeking to challenge decisions. Uh, it just shows how quickly time moves on. And again, looking um, back at the shorter distance, um, recreational aviation was a flavour of the month. Um, we had a Secretary of State who was very interested in general aviation, and that was reflected in much of the priorities given to the CAA. And innovation and space have come very much to the fore and put the CAA in a position where it's, it's doing things differently and, and consciously choosing how to organise itself and being very particular about the skills it needs to enable innovation, innovation and innovators.
Um, of course, we've had the pandemic. Um, it was busy enough without the pandemic. The pandemic only sort of took us took us beyond what was in, what was predictable. Um, but what what's also changed, apart from the fact that you know, work never stops, there are new people coming into the sector. People who are not traditional aviation entities are now aviating in a way that they've not done so before. And that's bringing pressures on the system and its capacity. Um, stakeholders are increasingly vocal. Again, I'm saying that very diplomatically, just in case um, anyone does watch the video later on. And there seem to be s dwindling reserves of goodwill, which makes it all the more difficult uh, to keep working uh, when everything can sometimes, can sometimes feel very hard. And then we've got new technologies that ask questions about the way we work. And to my mind, all of those competing factors highlight the thing that I mentioned earlier, the importance of, of developing and sustaining a coherent end-to-end -end process for making, implementing, and reviewing policy and law. And that includes deliberate consideration of whether you need to make law, change the law, or can use some sort of non-legislative approach. And where we've got to now, where we have a sort of fatberg, a great big lump of law, largely consequent on EU exit, it's cut and paste, it's in, it's in the UK statute book, but we don't really know how to move it forward. I don't think we continue, can continue with the ad hoc occasional incremental change. Um, and that, as I say, it's a very personal view, but, but I think we really do have to start thinking about what we do next. And that brings me to the third area of focus, what might the future hold? At the moment, there's quite a lot of time and money and attention and energy being given to unlocking capabilities and capacity. And we've seen in other transport modes, there's been a focus on the impact of technologies. For example, autonomous road vehicles have been studied by the Law Commission. And uh, I, for one, sincerely hope that we'll soon see something similar in relation to the impact of autonomous technologies in aviation. So perhaps we will see some genuine engagement and, and consultation on questions such as when automation ends and autonomy starts. And once you're in the realms of autonomy, who is the pilot? What are their responsibilities and who's liable? And I think, um, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, there'll be some work on that uh, coming forward. And if that does happen, that will be a really positive step forward, but I don't think it's enough, because as I said, I think we need to look at the framework, the system as a whole, and do so intentionally to make sure that it still works. Um, and you know, by the time I left at the end of 2021, you know, I was deeply frustrated at this, this, this fatberg of legal verbiage. I mean, that, that may sound pejorative. It, uh, it's deliberately designed to be provocative, but I hope you get a sense of my frustration at the ever-growing pile of rules, of AMC, of guidance, the additive approach that means that our framework will only ever become more extensive, more expansive, and more complicated, with the consequence that uh, it becomes less easy to understand and less easy to apply. I really was, and still am, very concerned that in some areas there is simply too much law, and it's difficult for us to work with and that in other areas we've got law that we're working with that isn't achieving the results that we hoped for. And you know, with the freedom of no longer being employed by DFT or CAA, it seems to me utter madness, you know, frankly utter madness, that in relation to consumer protection we have a never-ending stream of case law deciding whether or not a particular set of circumstances involving a particular airline on a particular day at a particular time was extraordinary. What a waste of effort. I'm sorry, it's just, oh, it just drives me mad.
and then roll forward to the pandemic, when that took hold, we find ourselves, or we found ourselves, and possibly still are, uh, tied up in knots because we're trying to apply a static set of provisions to unexpected and unpredictable circumstances. Couple that with the fact that there was just so much going on, and there has been so much going on for probably the last five to six years, it's proved impossible to take time to think and think long and hard and creatively about how we cater for the, for the existing and make space for the new and how we uh, allow for the sheer variety of human behaviour and the sheer ingenuity of business. Our legal code clearly does not always work. At worst, it fails to change harmful behaviour and does not provide us the protections that we were promised. When that happens, all that we have is a massive system of written rules that does little to keep our lives, societies, markets and environments safe. Those aren't my words. I'm, I'm not bold enough to, to say exactly that. But they are taken from a book uh, called The Behavioural Code, written by two legal academics and published last year. Uh, the, the two writers are Benjamin Van Roy and Adam Fine. And I wouldn't suggest that we've reached a position in aviation that is as bleak as all that. But on the assumption that we really do um, have a commitment post-Brexit to exercise freedoms in the way that we perhaps haven't been able to do that before, and on the assumption that we will get a fully functioning government sometime soon, I think we really do have a, an unrivaled and parallel, parallel opportunity to pause for thought. We have an opportunity consciously to think about how our framework encourages, sustains and enables good and better behaviours in the aviation sector and does so in a way that's flexible and effective and looks beyond traditional ways of doing things if that's going to work. Now some commentators have noted that there remains a view that simply by writing text legislators somehow hope to change real everyday behaviour. And that's a view I actually have quite a lot of sympathy with. Writing law doesn't you know, necessarily achieve much. And um, again, looking at um, the Queen's speech recently, and in particular the description of it on the .gov.uk website, I was um, somewhat surprised to note that Regulations for package travel will be updated and simplified, and here I'm quoting, so more businesses comply with the law, non-flight packages are better protected, and the quality of information and guidance is improved, simply as a result of the law being changed. Equally, the same Queen's speech promised to give the CMA, the Competition and Markets Authority, the ability to decide when consumer law had been breached and to issue monetary penalties. So more penalties to be applied after the problem has happened. Now, I accept that a brief description of uh, proposals on a website won't be able to explain thinking in depth. But as I stand here now, I really don't understand, or I'm not clear why, of itself, yet more law is going to help. Nor am I clear why increasing the range of potential punishments for conduct that has already happened is necessarily going to change the future. You know, law isn't a ma magician. And to quote those two authors again, once our political process has figured out what the right rules are, we must ensure that they work, lest we make seemingly just laws that are impotent. The problem is that thinking exclusively about what serves justice prevents us from thinking about how effectively to prevent future injustice. Now, some 20 years or so ago, uh, the philosopher Onora O'Neill in the Wreath Lectures spoke about the question of trust and her lectures were prompted by suggestions made at the time that there was a crisis of trust. Heaven only knows what she would make of the situation now if she were to give those lectures again. But one thing she said at the time, which I think still holds true, is that trust is needed not because everything is wholly predictable, let alone wholly, wholly guaranteed, but on the contrary, because life has to be led without guarantees. And if the last two years of pandemic have told us, taught us anything, it's that life does not have guarantees. She went on to say, the thought that nobody has rights unless others have duties is a precise logical claim, 
So in thinking about ethics and politics, we would do better to begin by thinking about what ought to be done and, ought to, and who ought to do it, rather than what ought we to get. So from my perspective, and this I emphasize again is a, is a purely personal one, if we do acknowledge that there can be no guarantees, even in the most, one of the most highly regulated sectors there is, then we do need to make sure that our framework, our architecture, creates space for trustworthiness and for trust, for trust to be earned, respected and rewarded, and for a range of sensible responses if that trust is abused or misplaced. Now, in the wake of the economic uh, sort of downturn in 2008, some legal academics began to look closely at the role of lawyers and how they enabled some of the problems at the time. And one strand of thinking conce conceived lawyers as engineers who drew up legal devices that were designed to have effects, but who also, in the view of these academics, had responsibility for the use to which those devices were put and the impacts they had. Stepping away from the purely legal context, context others have recently focused in depth on organisational or business purpose, with the aim of making sure that companies serve stakeholders, not just shareholders. In 2020, for example, the Said Business School at Oxford University published a document entitled Enacting Purpose Within the Modern Corporation, and it talks about the need for organisations to set out what they seek to solve. And Professor Colin Mayer says that the purpose of business is to solve the problems of people and planet profitably and not to prof profit from causing problems. And that was in 2020. And last year, 2021, um, others have begun to focus not on consumers but on citizens. And they describe, describe them as citizens with a capital C. Um, the author John Alexander has recently published a book on, with that title. And he writes, when we look to, to the government official, and I would put in square brackets, the regulator, we purchase with our vote to make all the bad things go away, to let us off the hook. That's a fundamentally disempowering and anti-democratic arrangement. Where the consumer story tells us we are entitled and passive, that we are to be sold to and served, citizens, with a capital C, actively shape the world around them. They cultivate meaningful connections to their communities and institutions. They can imagine a different and better way of doing things, and they take care and responsibility and create opportunities for others to do the same. It all sounds a bit motherhood and apple pie, perhaps, but um, I found those uh, strands of thinking and, and research quite inspiring in trying to look forward um, and all the more inspiring because they're not specific to aviation. They're more general perhaps in, in their purview. But I'm hoping that the future is more about coordination, about facilitation, about involvement, contribution, participation. Um, active inquiry rather than blind acceptance. And um, with a nod to my public law background, I'm sincerely hoping it takes us beyond the tried and tested methods of consultation document, consultation questions, consultation response document, decision, dissatisfaction, judicial review, delay, yada, yada, yada. I'm hoping that um, if we conceive of things slightly differently, we could get to a position where we proactively manage the framework as a whole, and where we proactively do that um, as a shared undertaking between government, regulator, industry, citizens, consumers, and you, the avi aviation legal community. Um, there's a number of different questions that you could ask when confronted with the opportunity uh, to make law or change law. What are we trying to do, really? What are we trying to do? Who are, we, who are we trying to attach our talents to and why? Do we know enough about what they do, really, to make sure that the law makes sense? And with an eye to that fatberg of legal verbiage, are we clear that it's possible to understand who, who is required to do what and in what circumstances and for what reason? <coughs> 
So I'm going to continue to think about these questions in the future because I have the luxury of time. Um, uh, given the range of brilliance in this room and outside this room, I really hope that you will take the opportunity to think about those sorts of questions as well and that you will hold um, civil servants and regulators to account for doing the same. Um, I'm conscious that I've covered quite a lot of ground today. I'm also conscious that I may have been less technical, less legal than some of you expected. Uh, and you may disagree with everything that I've just said. Uh, if that's the case, that's fine. We can, we can have a talk, talk about it over a glass of wine in a moment. Um, but just to, to sort of round up, looking back on 18 or so years um, uh, in the aviation legal field, I, I found a wonderful quote by Douglas Adams, who's an author I, I quite like. And it's, it's this. I may not have gone where I intended to go, but I think I've ended up where I needed to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Um, we now have a very short period of time um, to ask some questions of Kate. I think we're going to take two questions. Um, given the drinks are calling us on the terrace. Um, has anyone got any questions? If so, we have a lovely red mic by George um, that you can attend to and ask your question. If you do ask a question, please keep it short and to the point. Yeah, uh, this is Yongkyu from Three Oaks Aviation Consultancy. Uh, forgive me, I didn't wear, uh, I, I don't wear a suit because it's too hot. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, uh, my question is, uh, since you mentioned uh, Chicago Convention, then uh, now the whole, uh, the worldwide, uh, now the, uh, a lot of drones, uh, drones, I mean UAVs uh, flying, and going to more and more, uh, are going to, then we really need a, convention in the future, an inter international convention to uh, regulate in the Zoom. That's a uh, because as I know, uh, there is a, a flying car uh, in, innovated by some Chinese companies, but it cannot get uh, no law to the government, so it cannot uh, going to be production, going to production line. Yeah, this is the first question. The other question is, uh, about in the in ten years' time, will our solicitors be replaced by AI? <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Um, on, on the Chicago Convention point, um, from recollection, I think it's Article Eight of the Convention does deal with aircraft that don't have pilots on board. George is nodding, so I may have got that right. Thank you, George. So, to some extent. You know, the, per the people who wrote that convention n, n years ago were, were very clear-sighted and, and forward-thinking. Um, so coming back to the, sort of, it's like the central thesis of, of, of my session, I would hope we would think long and hard about the need for another convention. You know, just because we can convene a group of lawyers to, to draft text doesn't mean that we ought to. And, it, and I say, lawmaking can become habit. And I'm reminded that in relation to GNSS, you know, satellites and, and that sort of technology, there was uh, at one time a push for a convention that covered all of that as well. And uh, there was quite a lot of work done at ICAO level, which ultimately concluded, no, we don't need a convention because there's plenty of coverage already. So I wouldn't want to rush to a convention just for drones, because I think uh, Chicago and its annexes have, have demonstrated themselves to be quite flexible so far. Um, as to the, the uh, impact of AI on solicitors, is it time for a drink? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I suppose, if you like, the, the difference between automation and autonomy. You know, automation is 
the applica application of relatively well-known heuristics. Autonomy is when the machine and the coding within the machine allows it to learn uh, from the context and, and what it's doing. Um, given the depth of experience we have in this room, it's going to take an awful lot of algorithm to replicate that in the short term. But um, yeah, I wouldn't rule it out in the long term, but you know, don't, don't quote me on what the long term actually is in, in, in terms of years. Has anyone asked a final question for Kate? No, I've got a quick question actually. Um, what was the most bizarre <laughs> moment of your time at the CA in particular? My most bizarre moment at the CA? Yeah, I mean, just, just because I've had a few discussions with you, many other drinks in terms of um, <laughs> some of the experiences which I find, you know, as a, as a lawyer, you, you expected to, to review law, you know, be in meetings, support, report to your stakeholders, but I mean, you've donned a high-vis jacket and, and I, attended I, I, yeah. airports after the demise of, of Monarch, for example. I mean, I, I think it is that high-vis jacket experience. If you put on a high-vis jacket, you're instantly clothed with omnipotence. So it was, I mean, we, we, we did it twice, you know, Monarch and Thomas Cook. And I can recall um, at being at Luton Airport, wearing a high-vis jacket, and a gentleman coming up to me saying, you must explain to me how the internet works in this airport terminal. And I tried valiantly to say, no, I'm a lawyer, I'm here with the CAA and we're trying to get passengers from this flight from Palma de Mallorca off to Birmingham or whatever. But he refused to accept that I didn't know how the internet worked in the terminal and therefore you know, um, couldn't help him connect his device. That, that was fairly weird. Um, I mean, in terms of... I'm just reminded, actually, of, of, of one thing that happened. I'm just checking the room to see if anyone here was in the hearing that related to Monarch. One of the most peculiar uh, instances was when an individual um, linked with one of the major uh, investors in Monarch offered to write a check during the, the hearing to tie, tide us over so that we wouldn't make a decision about the operating license. So literally, I can write you a check now for a certain amount of money, which uh, I've never seen in my life, uh, if that would help you make a decision that the operating license shouldn't be revoked. But that was quite bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good to hear. <laughs> well, thank you, Kate, for providing such an interesting and humorous retrospective of your time at the DFT and the CEA, plus also your thoughts looking forward. You've covered not only air law, it was great to see, obviously, references to the preambles of the Chicago Convention, um, but philosophy. Um, myself, as a practicing aviation solicitor, I was particularly interested in your view of consumer protection law uh, and the role of lawyers as engineers of um, legal problems. So um, maybe we'll discuss that over, over some drinks. Um, and it remains me to say yeah, thank you once again. And um, also thank you to Kennedy's for their generous sponsorship of this event. We could not have held it without the uh, sponsorship. And um, thank you to everyone attending. Uh, I now invite you to get up the stairs for some drinks on the terrace. Thank you very much.